All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this thesis theater event. My name is Dr. Brenton Dickinson, and I am here as a host for a thesis theater. This is a Signum University tradition where we take our newly minted or newly completed MAs with their thesis in hand and give them a chance to talk about their research. We find that sometimes uh, the vaults, uh, the databases of uh, MA theses don't always get quite the impact that we would like. And so we always want to record a conversation for 45 minutes or an hour and then have it as part of our YouTube, uh, Signum University YouTube channel for perpetuity. And so we're pleased to have Jens Heber here today. Uh, and I'm excited because I'm not only the host of this particular event, but I'm also his supervisor for this project. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but I want to actually just begin with a little bit of context to what's going on with Signum University this fall. Our, our fall classes are uh, away and are actually winter classes, January classes, so the registration will be open very soon. Uh, what is really interesting is that we're in the middle of our annual fund campaign. Signum University is a completely independent non-federally uh, international, um, uh, no government or sponsored program. And so we really rely on keeping our costs low and our costs are quite low. Our programs as accessible as possible. To do that, we have an annual fundraising campaign and which kicked off on Hobbit Day as it does each year on September 22nd and goes uh, sometimes till about Halloween or thereabouts. Uh, this year, this is uh, one of our events. There's also next week another thesis theater on October 8th on sound and ritualistic language in Charles Williams' War in Heaven, which um, Williams is one of uh, uh, kind of a dark horse favorite uh, here at Signum University. Uh, none of us have had the courage or, or the um, Wisdom, I don't know, to teach an entire Williams class, but he haunts a number of our Inklings courses. Uh, and so we look forward to that next week. Also in the next week or so, we have Lord of the Rings activities. We, there's uh, um, uh, things that are always going on. Middle Moot is coming up uh, in a week or so. And we've also got a couple of open classes uh, with our folkloric transformation class. And uh, we're going to have one on Monday night with Maggie Park, and I'm going to be doing one uh, on October 13th. Uh, and so these are open to you. You can join, you can find this all out at the Signum University events page, so signumuniversity.org. Maggie's is actually on adaptation and fandoms, which is a really intriguing vampire-ish topic. And then mine is on the anatomy of a vampire myth, where I'm popping up a whiteboard and we're going to we're going to draw our way through the hour. So uh, I hope you like drawing. So bring your, your stories to those moments. And then uh, there's a number of events. Check out the Signum University event page. And you can also check out, I don't know, we have 20, 25, 30 thesis theaters that are on the Signum University YouTube page. So check them out. It's a great way to see what uh, students are doing in their learning and then how they can prepare for that learning out in the world. As part of our MA degree in language and linguistics at Signum University, we require our students to come up with about a 15,000 page or 15,000 word um, thesis. <laughs> Although, to be fair, some of our rough drafts, <laughs> yeah, some of our rough drafts have been 15,000 pages, but a 15,000 word thesis. And the idea is we want uh, out of the students' work uh, to have something that would be approximate to an academic level paper for a journal, something to be adapted for conferences, something that could be a book chapter, or something that could be made into popular articles. That's the goal of this, is to actually, in a, in a humble and integrative way, to contribute to the academic project. And what's really important is in the work of Octavia Butler, which we're talking about tonight, the scholarship is relatively new. Uh, it wasn't long ago that she passed away. Uh, her body of work is strong. Uh, she produced, you know, at one point she was producing a book every 18 months or thereabouts and uh, a number of short stories. Her work is strong, but it's still being at the stage of being studied. And so Jens's uh, uh, thesis is able to come in and have a conversation about this at the early stages of that, which we don't we don't always find. Signum University is good at studying dead people. Uh, in, in this case, this is this is a pretty uh, recent scholar and someone uh, who, who we wish uh, was not dead um, at this point. So uh, I think that I made that about as awkward as I could, didn't I, Jens? 
So um, I want to introduce Jens and then uh, introduce uh, his title and then I'll hand it over. Um, I do, uh, I do uh, want to note that we have, um, I, I do want to give uh, some thank yous and just before I, I forget, before we get to the end, we also have uh, Dr. Yolanda Hood was part of this process as the second uh, reader. Uh, Yolanda is actually a colleague of mine, uh, someone that I admire and uh, uh, she has been um, someone who studies in particular African-American and Black folklore and fantasy, um, it, uh, particularly on the American continent. And uh, she, you know, knows that context too of Octavia Butler, which was really, really helpful. Now Jens Heber's a uh, high school English teacher from Germany, uh, although you have this kind of international man of mystery uh, background there, <laughs> resume there. Um, I think uh, four continents, right, that you've spent a good deal of time on, yeah. Uh, his fascination with all things speculative fiction informs his studies, uh, his readings, his teaching, his creative writing. Over the year uh, or eight months or so of this thesis, nine months of the thesis, we've talked about books that went all across the range because we're both teaching at the same time. Uh, someday he hopes to release his fiction upon the world, uh, and uh, I think we have more than one signum night with a novel in the drawer. He lives on the island of Penang. Uh, Penang? with his wife, two cats, and an assortment of tropical fish. And you've gone this year through the uh, uh, the movement of your normal in-class courses into a remote education sphere and then into all kinds of things uh, as we are in this new global moment, right? So it's been qu quite, a, quite a year for that. So Jens's thesis is called Negotiated Symbiosis, Power, Identity, and Community, and the works of Octavia E. Butler, okay? And so uh, what I want to do now is I want to give uh, the microphone to Jens and he's going to spend, I, I don't know how long, 10 minutes or, or a little longer, talking about the basic concepts of the thesis. Uh, not all of you will be familiar with all of Octavia Butler's work, but you may have encountered some of it. Um, but we also would invite, uh, so not just questions about the material, after he presents that, we'll do a little dialogue. There's a question box which you can put questions into. We invite those questions, but we also invite you to kind of think past this. Uh, Jens has discovered a kind of framework that uh, maybe has applicability outside of Octavia Butler's to other kinds of writers, because this is just one of the good things that speculative fiction uh, works for, right? So, so we want you to think, so we'll deal with this and his topic, but we also want you to think imaginatively outside of that using your own experience. And if I ask you to clarify, that's a good thing. I just want you to speak a little more to the question or comment that you're making, the links that you make. So, all right, Jens, well, congratulations on completing thus far. Now, would you tell us a little bit about your work, please? Sure. All right. So, um, firstly, for those who are not as familiar with Octavia Butler, um, she died, as Brenton said, quite recently in 2006. Um, and it was a few months after she died that I read my first book by her. So, I was very sad to discover upon looking her up that, oh, I will never meet this amazing woman. Um, I then went and read all the rest of her work. Um, she was very well celebrated, um, wrote, um, won numerous awards, uh, and was very much kind of at the forefront of what she was doing. She changed a lot about kind of what we mean when we read science fiction, and it was very, very well done. So I've been fascinated with her um, writing for quite some time, and as I was in university and then beginning my master's, I kind of always knew that my thesis was going to have something to do with um, her work and eventually narrowed it down. Um, so my initial interest was in this idea of symbiosis as something that shows up a lot in her works. I think anyone who's read more than a few works by her starts seeing a certain pattern. Um, and I was interested to figure out what not just what it does, but like how it works within within each text. Um, and so I, in my research, I was looking a lot at, okay, what are the biological elements? Um, she, as a science fiction writer, was less concerned. Her science of the science fiction was biology. She uh, was less interested in um, the physics and she was, she did a lot of reading. She loved, reading things that were some 
seemingly unconnected sometimes and that you'd put her ideas together. Um, those of us who write know kind of what that process is like. Um, and she would find things specifically in biology. And so I thought I was fascinated by the fact that she kept coming back to different forms of symbiosis. So um, early on in my paper, I do some definitions of symbiosis as I think we're generally vaguely familiar with this idea of two beings that sort of live and feed off each other. Um, we kind of like the ones that um, they're mutually beneficial, everybody's happy. Um, very commonly, I think the clownfish and the sea anemone are usually used as a good example. Um, but even in early definitions of symbiosis, the parasite is kind of part of that conversation. And the parasite is living on the host and just taking. Um, so one of my one of the things I discovered was that a lot of times when people speak about symbiosis, it's a continuum. So on the one end, we have very much mutualistic symbiosis, and on the other, it's just a parasite who takes and feeds and gives nothing back. And a lot of Butler's work, her symbiotic relationships fall somewhere along that continuum. And depending on the story, they land kind of differently. Um, along with that, I noticed that she didn't just use like literal symbiosis on a biological, physiological level. She had a lot of metaphorical symbiosis as well. And that was the part that I was most interested in. And so what I decided to do was look at some of her works, particularly some of the major themes that show up in, in her writing. And so a lot of the scholarship has focused on specifically race and gender. Um, as an African-American woman writing in um, science fiction, she was doing some new stuff. And so that's necessarily going to show up and be significant. Um, she also wrote a lot about economic injustices. Um, she talked about power, identity, community. Those are the three that um, I decided to hone in on a little bit. And I discovered that through looking at kind of the metaphorical uses of symbiosis, it allowed for an extra level of depth for looking at some of those previously explored themes in her works. And so that allowed me to both integrate into the existing scholarship that's already been done on her work and also hopefully offer something um, slightly new or a slightly different way of looking at um, some of what she's done. So essentially I picked three texts. Um, the first one was a very well-known one, Blood Child. Uh, it's one that she won a lot of awards for. Uh, it's very well anthologized, lots of research. And so I decided to start with that one just to test my theory of, hey, does this, does this work? And then I use that as a template to kind of then move forward into some of her less studied work. So the second ones I do are Amnesty, which is um, a short story that was released a little bit later and hasn't seen quite as much scholarship, and then Fledgling, which is her last novel. And so the goal was to kind of show this pattern of using symbiosis, specifically symbiosis as it changes over time. Um, there's a fancy word uh, called symbiogenesis, which I can talk about in a bit. And this idea that symbiosis is not a static thing, but it changes. And it needs to be, in essence, negotiated by the different partners within that relationship. And to kind of show how that pattern plays out in a number of her works. So that's the kind of the basic framework um, that I use to approach it. And it, it left me realizing that my project was maybe larger than um, I had initially thought. So narrowing it down is always a big problem. I tell my students, um, the narrower you get, the more you have to say. And so the more I narrowed down, the more I found I had to say. Um, my uh, second reader, Dr. Hood, um, in her comments suggested that maybe I consider taking some of these sections, turning them into chapters and adding some more. And I can't say that that doesn't also sound appealing. So it uh, it could happen. So that's a basic overview of of my thesis. So let's let's take those let's take those three stories. And just because our attendees, uh, probably those that look up the thesis theater later will be Octavia Butler fans um, or sci-fi fans anyway. And so let's actually just take that out. And so how quickly? And one of the 
this, so this is a tip for students. One of the things that Jens did well in his thesis was he didn't spend a lot of time summarizing the stories because that that takes up a lot of space in a short piece. And he just basically presumes that people can go and look up at a book cover jacket himself. But but let's let's actually start, um, let's start with Blood Child. And that's actually an interestingly complex, but pretty short story. And is it fair to say really her, her most famous um, short story? Octavia Butler's most famous? Yeah, the short story is it's her most well-known. Yeah, I think the there's a kind of a fan uh, book of, or the, uh, is it the, um, the um, the Book of Martha is kind of a bit of a, um, you know, it's been, uh, I think, uh, ripped off the most, I think, shared illegally online for the most amount of time. But uh, so so tell us just super quickly the story of Blood Child, because I think that will demonstrate pretty well what you mean when you say, on one side, we can have parasites that are just uh, drawing from a host, like a foreign body drawing from a host. And, and that symbiosis, there's a mutual need because they're attached, but really one gains much more than the other versus uh, on the other side, it's completely mixed, right? Everybody wins and then various things in between, okay? So let's plot some of these stories and and this is something then that, uh, you know, the, the people watching can start to do in their own mind using other kinds of frameworks. But do you want to give us just a little blood child summary, please? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the backstory um, that Butler doesn't spend terribly much time on is that humans, some humans, fled Earth, whatever reason, it seems like they were maybe persecuted for something, landed on a planet that has these large insect-like, I think somewhere between a giant millipede and a scorpion maybe, um, these creatures that live there, and they're incredibly powerful. And so after a time of violence, um, they found a sort of equilibrium in which the humans are kept in a preserve, and they are protected by some of these creatures, uh, they're called the Talik. And so the main character is a young boy named Gan, who lives with his siblings and his mother. Um, his father, interestingly, is not in the picture. And then the other member of their family is one of the Talik. Um, her name is Tigatoy. And she is also kind of in charge of the preserve. And the way that Essentially, the Talik use humans and implant their eggs, and then they, the larvae grow. And then eventually, when they reach a certain stage, then the Talik will come remove the larva from the human, sew them back up. And uh, if the human keeps living, it's not um, deadly to them if everything goes according to plan. And in that sense, the, um, the humans on this planet, they, Butler calls them Terrans in the story. Um, they what they gain out of this is one, a space to live, which, I mean, that's why they came here in the first place. And secondly, they are given some benefits from this symbiosis. So they um, will feed on some of the sterilized, the sterile eggs from the Talik and they will gain long life and extra health. And um, physiologically, it's quite beneficial for them. And so in reading the story, looking at it, I realized that there's two different forms of symbiosis. So on the biological level, we have the alien implanting eggs into the human body, and it's quite gruesome. Um, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a disturbing story in that sense. So people with a softer stomach, it's not a great place to start necessarily. But the way that the grubs are described as worms, as burrowing, it's very clear that we as the readers are meant to follow with the main character and being kind of repulsed by it. Um, and our main character again witnesses one of these rub extractions gone wrong. Um, the human survives, no worries. And essentially he has second thoughts because he knows this is his future. Um, the second symbiosis is interestingly reversed in which it's this planet belongs to the Talik. This is their home world and the humans have come and they are a sort of parasite on the world. The world is their host. And so, so in the society, they are the parasite. What's interesting, and this is why I chose to focus on specifically power dynamics in this story, is that the power dynamics in both symbiosis, both the biological and the 
societal economic version in both cases the talik have the upper hand they kind of determine what's going on and so throughout the story most of it is a conversation between gan and this talik who lives with them to Gatoy, who is sort of a mother figure in that she has lived with the family all along um she's quite a bit older um she is also a sibling because it's later revealed that her when she was a grub she was taken from gan's father's body so yeah. there is a very much a biological connection there as well and she is going to implant him with these grubs now we then start moving into impregnate and is she his mother his sibling his lover it's it's all of those rolled into one yeah. and so the negotiation between the two of them this conversation that they have becomes the negotiation between both them as individuals um, as part of their little community as to what happens with gan's body but then also for the larger it has larger ramifications for the entire terran society because this particular Talik is in charge of the preserve and she can bring about changes that could benefit both species in a sense. Yeah, it's what's interesting about the story, like, and you've kind of mapped it. So this is not just parasitic, but if the story was only told from one perspective, it would look entirely parasitic, right? Right, there's like, yeah. you, you could tell the story just from the perspective of the Talik or the human, the Terran and say, well, well, look, clearly this person is a parasite in my space, right? You know, yeah. but it's also, the mutuality is just not like this freewheeling kind of hippie commune of, of you know, let's, you know, love or something, right? Like, mm -hmm. but it's more complex than that, right? It's somewhere, so that's your word negotiated, right? That there's, yeah. you know, there's a, a, a thing going on. And you also get the sense, don't you, that Tagati uh, to, to is, um, I almost think of the name as like the the throat sound, and then the mm -hmm. tlick is yep. like the the little kind of claws moving across the the floor yep. or something. Yeah, like that sound of the the carapace moving. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. But yep. like I, I get the sense too that that they're holding, um, uh, this tlick is holding at bay a whole society of tlick or tlicki or yep. something outside that are that could potentially just simply wipe out um and use the word preserve right that's in the text yeah. right yeah. so there's a kind of reverse animality here where it's the mm -hmm. talik or the the humans in the sense that they are the dominant species of the planet and the humans the terrans have been kind of moved into this preserve like yeah. zebra or something right um yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a, it's a very fascinating thing. And so power, power dynamic was the way that you um, talked about that. Were there places, were there places where either, uh, how do I say the name? Tagati? Tagat? 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 Tagatoy. Tagatoy. Tagatoy and Gan. Were there places in the story where they could have tilted the balance of power, at least in their family dy dynamic? Mm -hmm. Um, and did they do so, or did they choose not to? How did they negotiate when there were, when, if it's a power negotiation, then that means there's moments of strength and weakness. So was, were there any moments of that where that could have happened? Yeah, um, the one that I ended up focusing on the most um, was around the issue of firearms. So yeah. Butler is very good at kind of physical descriptions. And so like you were demonstrating, the way that Talik move is described as very unsettling in some ways. They have a stinger, they have claws, um, they're hard in a sense, they have a carapace. Whereas the humans are frequently described as very soft and we see this guy sliced open so that the grubs can be removed. And so the humans are very much physically defenseless and they're also not allowed to have any weapons, specifically guns. Um, and that kind of refers back to their initial conflict between the two. Gan has a gun in the house. His father left it for him, and he needs this gun to go and shoot some creature out back. Um, Butler calls it an ahti, but who knows what that is. Um, and so basically he has to go shoot this so that the grubs can be taken from this other man's body and put in them. And that, in essence, ends up saving this man's life. 
And so later, when after this kind of very intense moment is over, Tegat Toy says, they start negotiating about this gun where he says, someday that gun might save my life. Like this could have had, that could have been me. This gun needs to stay in the house. And she, for the first time, shows fear. She, we see a, a lot more human reaction in Tegat Toy at this point because she recognizes my, children are going to grow up in this house and there's going to be a gun here. Yeah. And she's concerned about that because she knows what guns do to her people. And yet at the end, Gan basically makes a point where he says, accept the risk. That's, that's the phrase that he uses as when dealing with a partner, there is risk. And sure. so at the end, she lets him keep the gun because she recognizes that if she's going to treat him as more than just an animal, more than just a host for future grubs, she has to allow him some level of um, of self-defense, in a sense. Um, so that's probably the, the clearest cut example um, in the story. Yeah, no, it's super, it's super clear. And even just the way, like, to use preserve rather than reserve or reservation is really intriguing, mm -hmm. considering the American, so, you know, um, First Nations, Native, uh, Aboriginal reservations in Canada, the United States, Australia, and other places where the you know weaponry was limited. The the you you mm -hmm. get you get almost a District Nine feel in this story, although the story yep. precedes uh, District Nine, right? And and so there, uh, you know, but there there seems to be more negotiation, at least with this one Talek, right? You know, there's a yep. uh, we don't know what's going on, like. For example, there's a in a place where you're not allowed to have a gun, a rifle goes off at night, you know, mm -hmm. in a in a reserve which you presume to be fairly tight, and we have no idea what that means to the outside world, right? Um, so there's so everything is left out except this one family, right? Yeah, it's mm -hmm. pretty pretty intriguing, and uh, and then the story amnesty is like the opposite story, right? Uh, and and I think I think Gone is a little unusual because he there's not many male protagonists you know no. in butler's stories particularly the long stories uh there's some men of power but the the we perspective is typically a woman's perspective right the mm -hmm. uh, xenogenesis or lilith's brood i guess might be another way of putting the, that trilogy of books a little later uh, in my trilogy Gor gorgeous trilogy uh space mm -hmm. um, space earth trilogy so the um so amnesty i think you can actually tell it's a little bit simpler in concept but but let's see how the negotiation works in that one do you want to just tell us yeah so amnesty is probably one of my favorites of her stories um it's one that i will sometimes use in my in my ap classroom it so essentially these aliens come to earth so got some stuff switched around um, they're called communities, which I personally find fascinating. Um, yeah. And they're described as kind of these large bush-like entities that are actually made up of like hundreds of individual entities. But these individuals can't live alone. They have to be part of these communities. And so they're both plural and singular simultaneously. Um, and so they've come to earth, they've put up these like enclosed bubbles in various desert regions. So they're not, you know, invading cities or anything. And so they initially kidnap a few humans. They're like, what are these animals? Let's figure out what's going on with these things. Um, these creatures are highly intelligent. And so they put a bunch of humans through the ringer and uh, it's never described super clearly. Um, it supposedly wasn't great. Um, and they have very little in common with humans. And our main character, um, a woman by the name of Noah Cannon, is telling this to some other humans. So essentially she was kidnapped as a child, was raised in one of these um, bubbles, I guess, uh, was tortured, eventually released, and then she was captured by humans in the government who were like, you must be a spy. So they did terrible stuff to her as well, trying to get her to confess and so on. That's all backstory. And she has now grown and become a translator between the humans and the communities. And so we see, in, in this case in particular, I used um, Donna Haraway's cyborg metaphor theory uh, for someone who's kind of forging a non-existent middle path 
And so over the course of the story, she is translating for some other humans that have come to work for the communities. Essentially, the community arrival disrupted most of Earth's economies. Um, the communities are super wealthy because they can get at a bunch of the uh, minerals in the, in the, below the Earth's crust. And so they're one of the best employers on the planet. And a lot of the humans are very, we don't have any choice, but we don't like these guys. So can't they just go back where they came from? And Butler makes it clear through her main character, no, these creatures cannot leave. They're stuck on this planet for the foreseeable future. And now we have to find a way to live with each other. And through this character of Noah, who's a translator, um, she kind of starts working on that negotiation. So really the negotiation is within Noah herself. Um, and it's happened kind of prior to the story and she then explains it to these other humans. And I focused on the, in the story in particular, there is a biological element in which there's a symbiosis. Um, but it's significantly less important than in some of her other stories. Um, so I focused mainly on two of the metaphorical ones, which have to do with that kind of economic employment exchange and then language as well. Um, this idea of language as a, as a metaphorical symbiosis between the two people groups. Yeah, because language for you and I is in a sense... Um... Uh, invisible and not contactless, we might say. You, you know, if mm -hmm. I know, if we're speaking sign language, we see, you know, um, if we're uh, speaking, it, it's sound waves hitting the ears. But in that, in the book, it's actual physical touch mm -hmm. in in ways that can, can be uh, moved past consensuality uh, and mm -hmm. almost violence. Is that, is that, am I interpreting it right in the story? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So the physical, it's almost, um, uh, Helen Keller, where she was first taught by yeah. the touch in the palm. It's that, I think, except in back of, in the spinal column, right? Yes. Or, yeah. Yes. So the the humans are, this is kind of part of the biological side, the humans are enfolded into these communities. Um, that's the biological component. They, um, the communities find that very pleasurable. It's used as they kind of, it's a sort of drug for them. It kind of eases a sense of uh, homesickness for them and it's not terrible for the humans once they get used to it um, and but they had, communities don't have ears they don't hear they they've taught themselves to read sort of um, but they're very touch oriented as is evidenced by the enfolding and so they the way that this language um, that Noah herself was part of developing during her captivity with one of the communities that she's kind of grown to think of as a friend, she basically, the human is enfolded, makes certain gestures, and I'm guessing it's not just hand gestures, I'm guessing it's kind of larger, and um, and so the, and then the community responds with kind of a tactile sensation on the back. And so they've developed this language that works for both of them. Yeah. And we see a lot of the, a lot of the characters in the story that she's telling this to they're like why can't these why can't these aliens just learn our language right why can't why can't they accommodate us completely not understanding that the power dynamics are very different these aliens are very powerful and the fact that they did not destroy humanity is kind of revealed at the end of the story as a sort of surprise that no these are very very powerful beings they do not have to learn human language they could just have kept abducting humans but they realize no this these are sentient creatures and we want to live on the planet with them and accommodate them in some ways. Um, and so that's kind of how that negotiation gets started. Yeah. But the humans are a little addictive, right? Like that's, that's part yeah. of the thing. Now it's I, the word, the phrase, and I don't know if it's a real word, but like physiolinguistics is kind of the word mm -hmm. that comes to my mind. And intriguingly, they're not speaking the same language to each other, right? They're, she, you know, humans are speaking one language to them and the community is speaking one mm -hmm. language back right um mm -hmm. it's maybe the same language but they're using different symbols to reference the same yeah, uh, different mediums i guess yeah, yeah yeah the referent and the symbolic yeah so good excellent so and then um i, I don't know that we want to spend a ton on uh, fledgling it's just your typical vampire tale right what, what makes fledgling different so fledgling really is a vampire story right it it yeah. really is it's just about a vampire mm -hmm. story like the 
Amnesty, it uses stra the stranger point of view, but actually has it internal. And so like Noah, it's very a lot going on within the main character's uh, frame and, and mentality. But it's a little different than a vampire tale. So why don't you just say, like, what is the special thing that, that Octavia Butler adds to vampire fiction within this, this story? Um, so it's... The, there's nothing supernatural about the vampires. Um, again, she's um, sticking with her biological register, as uh, some of the scholars have called it, that she, she wants a biological explanation. And so vampires, they're called the Ina. They're, they're just a different species, and they've been living on Earth alongside us all along in a sort of symbiotic relationship. Um, so that's kind of the first major difference. They're not undead. They're not um, Dracula. They're not supernatural in a sense, right? Yeah, there's there's none of this like cackling. They're treated as a sort of very humanoid, very relatable, very um, we can if we're not careful, we can almost think of them as just another form of humans in a sense. Um, and then the, they don't, at least intentionally, most of them, they don't try to kill humans. They, when they feed, they do that within relationship. So they don't go out just grazing. They have what Butler calls symbionts. So each Ina vampire has kind of a family around them, um, of humans that are bonded to them. So that's kind of where the physiological element comes from. Um, and they will feed off of them. It's very pleasurable for both the human and the vampire. Uh, it's addictive for the human, um, particularly. Um, but the vampire also does not do well without their without their symbionts. The humans gain extra health, longer life. Um, so this is very much mutualistic, uh, even though a lot of the power still does rest with uh, with the Ina in the story. So those are kind of the major differences of Butler's use of vampires over kind of some of the more conventional fare. Right. And so there's an ethical choice for the Ina, the vampires, that they either choose to be consensual, like in their symbiosis or not. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's some that go and hunt, gather and basically keep cattle around, right, humans as servants to them. Uh, and then there's um, her Ina. Um, uh, uh, Shori, what, uh, what's the other name for Shori? I guess Shori is the one she's yeah, mostly known as. Shori. Yeah. So Shori's family, um, her larger Ina family, has a kind mm -hmm. of an ethical code where there's yeah. a, because um, if if you if she feeds off of a symbiont for for some for someone for too long, they become a symbiont without ever really consenting to it because it's addictive. Yes. It's it's sort of like you know, you know, uh, being offered the drug versus, you know, trying it out and mm -hmm. seeing how, you know, yep. you know, until yep. you can't choose anymore. So, yeah, so it is, it really is mutual. Um, and I think is the best example of love in, in the way that we understand it uh, in, in the stories that you've covered, right? Yeah. yeah. But it's never, it's never really easy. Now, like, um, and, and so at this point, uh, sorry, I, I've been caught up chatting with, with Jens here about the stories. Hopefully we've given you some con concepts. If you have any clarification questions or any specific questions, now would be a good time to put them into the box. Um, uh, what um, we've tried to do, I think, is, is it's fairly technical, but not use very technical language, except the word symbiosis here. Uh, mutualistic just means that the relationship between the two. Uh, Fledging is a vampire tale, but... Um, would I would I be kind of over speaking and saying that in a sense all of Octavia Butler's work is vampiric at least a little bit I mean it's there's definitely that tendency there I mean she when her when her characters tend more to the parasitic there is always this taking of life um, Probably her character Doro in yeah. uh, the Pattern Master series. He is he is very very parasitic in in many ways. He's he doesn't have a physical body. He just seems to take and 
So kind of with him on kind of the far extreme on the one end, uh, we then have in fledgling the vampires where there's much more um, of a mutual understanding of what's happened, at least eventually once people grow with into that into that relationship. That's right. Yeah. And Xenogenesis, which is a later uh, real sci-fi in the sense of aliens are connecting with Earth mm -hmm. in a post nuclear holocaust scenario i guess it is right um the it takes a long time to figure out what that symbiosis is and what yeah. humans gain um but in a sense the main character she never she comes to love the people deeply mm -hmm. would give her life to the people has made this connection with the, the these new uh, species that need her uh had children with them right but there's still this kind of she has this current of resentment within yeah. her, right? That never goes away. We maybe we see that in in Gone a little bit too. Again, I I don't know if, if you read it that way. Um, in Noah, you can yeah, see, I think yeah, you can see Noah yeah, really her, trying not to intentionally. I I choose not to be resentful. Yes. yes, yes, I think Noah tries not to. Though I think we can see that tendency there, because I mean, she does speak about it several times. Um, Gan, I think, is more accepting because in his mother, we see some of that resentment. I think Gan has understood the need for, for that relationship to work long-term. Um, yeah, no, I think so too. I think, um, and actually Gan almost strikes me more as like a idealistic teenager in a sense. Like really trying, yeah. this is the moment that I as a teenager have to determine my path and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to work in this factory, but I'm going to, to, I want the factory to be a different place over the years that I work at it. Yeah. That kind of a, is that, am I reading that correctly? Yeah. 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 I think that's right. And I think he actually shows a lot of maturity in his understanding. Uh, one of the things that I notice is that between his other family members, so between his mother and his sister and his brother, we have three kind of more extreme outlooks on what this kind of symbiotic relationship with these aliens looks like. Yeah. And I think he's recognized that all three of them are missing something and he needs to find something that incorporates a little bit of all of them um, in his negotiation and in his relationship with them to like. Good. So um, let's go to the personal. It comes from a question here from Emmy. This, uh, um, you know, this may be outside the scope of this conversation, but why do you think Butler was so fascinated with symbiosis, since it's such a, a major theme in her work? Mm -hmm. And intriguingly, of course, you know, you know, think of sci-fi. You know, the last hundred years of science fiction, right? You know, and then say the phrase "black woman." You know, and not just a, a good sci-fi writer, mm -hmm. but a leader in her field. So where does all this kind of fit in, a, in a, particularly American, so not British or, or um, mm -hmm. you know, from the African continent or something. So where does all this kind of fit together in your reading of uh, Butler's own life? Because you did actually include some like letters and a little bit of bio bio biological biographical research uh, it, as a mm -hmm. background. Do you want to tell us a little bit of that story, Jens? Yeah. Um... So I think she, I, I read a number of, uh, quite a lot of the interviews that she gave over the course of her life. Um, there's a really great um, biography by Jerry Canavan. Mm. It's excellent. And I very much got the sense that she valued community far over the individual. And so I think she was very leery of, people that were characters, sometimes human, sometimes not, um, that were too inward focused on themselves. So my third section on fledgling is focusing specifically on kind of community formation um, and what that looks like. And I think in symbiosis, she found her metaphor for interdependence. She spoke in, in an interview one time where she said, my characters, have community and if they don't they create it around them yeah they're not meant to live by themselves i think the best example of that is lauren in her two parable books she's got nothing and then she's like i'm gonna, i'm gonna pull some people in and create that uh shori um in fledgling 
her, her family, her community is taken from her, both physically and then because she's lost her memory, she can't remember them either. And among the first things she does is, I'm gonna create a new community. And I think symbiosis gave Butler the, the vehicle she was looking for. So she's got the science, the biology, um, a lot of her stories have to end up end up having to do with genetics. Um, some of her short stories, uh, xenogenesis as well. Yeah. Um, so she's got the science angle of it, but she's also got the personal, the societal, the focus on we do better when we're with others, all of us, essentially. Um, so I think that's probably one of the things that drew her to coming back to symbiosis. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a scary thing to talk about, and I, I agree in my reading of, of Butler. Um, and particularly when we think of, you know, when, when you and I began this process, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement had not really lit up again in the United States. Uh, we were starting to talk about Afrofuturism, um, but, you know, speculative fiction, um, it's still not, uh, you know, it's still very white dominated, uh, as we saw with the recent um, Worldcon. Uh, you know, the the way that that whole conversation happened. Um, there's some great authors coming out here. Is uh, Nnedi Okorafor, right? Uh, N. K. Jemison, who have won awards, uh, a lot of awards recently with their work. So it's it's happening. But I I kind of wonder, and and I tremble a little bit to say this. I wonder if 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 Octavia Butler's offering, offering a fairly complex response and, a, and an almost unsatisfying response to what our mm -hmm. social moment would be, right? Like, yeah, she's not saying burn the house down, right? Yeah, I. one of the things that I love about her writing is, like you said, it's always complex, it's never simple. She yeah. never has a utopic solution. Um, or something. It's always a continuing, ongoing. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I liked the term negotiation. There's always going to be a component on which there's something more that needs to happen. Um, I think, in particular, with regards to race, she sometimes pushed back against people who wanted to read her stories simply as uh, one one of the scholars I read um, read uh, Blood Child and was talking about this is this is a form of slavery. And in some interviews, Butler pushed back and said, "No, this is not just about slavery. That's not the that's not the central focus I'm going for." She actually very explicitly says, "This is less a story about slavery and it's more about symbiosis." She actually uses that whole phrase. So. Um, and while race is very much a component of her stories, as is gender, as it's always about more than just one thing. Um, and so it's never, it's never a simple solution. There's never a completely happy end. I find them hopeful for the most part. Her stories are hopeful, um, yeah. but in a dystopian sort of way. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, it's intriguing that you say that, like, um, they're never nihilistic, no. But they're extremely realistic, right? Yes. And so, for a Black American woman to use, um, you know, so so, but they also aren't moralistic. So sometimes characters can be moralistic. Like Gan mm -hmm. finishes uh, that story, Blood Child, in kind of a moralistic tone. But the story itself mm -hmm. isn't moralistic because it, it's not like it it right. fixes everything, right? It's just kind of a next, right. Right, um, and and so for a Black American woman to use slavery as a metaphor mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. real thing she wants to deal with, right, must have been must mm -hmm. have shown some um, per, per, perspicuity, some some grace, some creativity, and some yeah. guts, right, to do that. Like, because yeah. there's very few voices yeah. like hers when she's writing that story, right, or those stories. Yes. Actually, it's not once. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I mean, she said multiple times. That she was writing for multiple audiences. She didn't want to be. She didn't want to be just the science fiction writer. She didn't want to be, the black writer. She she wanted to not get stuck on just the one shelf in the bookstore or the library. She recognized I'm doing several things, and she had multiple audiences and people who would come to her texts um, for different reasons. 
mm. because they work so well on so many different levels. Yeah, no, it's gorgeous. Yeah, no, it's, it's um, you say complex, but I actually find the tales, um, sometimes the novels, I, I want to reread the first few pages again, the first time. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't find them terribly complex, like in, in structure. It's just, you right. can't just simply say, this is what's going on. But you actually have to go exactly. through a process of interpretation like you did. So let's look at it from this frame. Same thing, women, mm -hmm. the subjugation of a particular woman character is is about mm -hmm. the character, and it, mm -hmm. but it's a metaphor for something else. And that metaphor isn't always, you know, male-female um, experience, right? Right. Power dynamics yeah. or something. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'm going to invite uh, people, if you have more comments or questions, or if you want to think about symbiosis and other pieces, you know, obviously the vampire fiction world is clearly one that, that would be tempting to think about. I would love to just hear your comments or questions here. Barbara actually has a pretty cool backstory question. Um, and I don't know if that came up in our conversation or not, Jens, but in Blood Childs, so like, what served as the larva repository before humans arrived, right? You know, and and so then did some did some other symbiotic resource fall away, or like how, or is this just adaptation? Like, but they larvae had to be somewhere. Where were they before? Yeah. Um, yeah. So there was apparently there was a creature on this planet world that they used to implant their larva in, and that creature kind of biologically changed enough to fight back and mm. so there were fewer and fewer larvae were being born um they were kind of smaller and more sickly and so when the humans showed up this was actually a very good thing for for the talik and so it kind of explains why some of the talik wanted to just say hey new animal let's go and then we see the more ethical to get toy who realizes okay these are not just animals um let's actually do something but she is in a sense holding back some of these other factions that would really just treat humans as um as just another form of kind of reproductive animal yeah and and that's the the the, the one of the real difference with the gatoy and the talik is from and fledgling the the vampires the ina or the ina uh, ina i i pronounce them ina but you pronounce them ina the they 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 have so much instinctive energy going through them that they they live their lives in in the mutual world always shepherding those instincts and controlling and setting yeah. context for them to make sure it's safe for them and for everybody else in their world right um tagato is just so intentional like she can impregnate him which is an interesting phrase she can impregnate yeah. him tonight or somebody else tonight you know and it's been leading up to this but it may not be tonight it could have been the day before you know like there's a, a certain kind of control and an energy to it that's still emotional and still instinctive right um yeah yeah i guess that's a, that's the the foundation of that story right is the male pregnancy yeah that was one of the uh she she kind of said one of the things she wanted to do was to write a male pregnancy story but kind of qualified it with not as a I can do anything a woman can or as a way to like prove something but she said like as an act of love yeah and I think that that is where the story ends yeah yeah no I don't think it's a remake of the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie whatever that was uh you know I think it's pretty terrible <laughs> So the, um, yeah, so that's, I mean, and, and I think that's, uh, I think that's the case that makes, um, I think that's the case that makes it um, powerful too. Like if it had just been, like, it's about something, but that we spend so much time looking away that you wouldn't guess, okay, what was the prompt that got the story going? You wouldn't you right. wouldn't guess what the prompt was right which i think sometimes like like with uh eco fiction like with the uh, environmental criticism uh environmental writing now uh kind of uh climate change cli-fi like you can yeah. tell the prompt was what would the world look like if or what am i doing now that creates this world or like yeah. you can feel the prompt in the story it's pretty rare mm -hmm. to know what could have prompted um, Octavia Butler to write the story? Am I, does that make yeah. any sense to you? Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, she she will tell us. Like, yeah. So in interviews, she'll say, yeah, so I was thinking about, so in this one, it's 
also the bot flies. She apparently went to Peru to research xenogenesis and was just horrified by this idea of these bot flies that just lay their larva in people and you can't do anything about it. You just have to wait for them to crawl out. She's like, that's terrible. I guess I better write a story about it. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And there's some people, I think some of the tribes have like ways of attracting the larvae out like with food or other flesh or something so yeah you gotta love gotta love where that becomes like the beginning of a story but that's part of her imaginative <laughs> complex right yeah okay well let's yeah. let's actually, let's wrap things up here uh, a little bit Jens um and and uh and then th uh, kind of in, invite in our minds kind of uh, an invitation in Octavia Butler's work uh, you talked about three stories that worked for you to be able to show that range of community power and identity, kind of uh, sometimes a mix, but maybe a highlight in each of the three stories that you talked about. Where would you where would you encourage people who are interested in Octavia Butler's work, where would you encourage them to, to begin as a journey? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think her, her early work may have been on the edge of fantasy, and then over time it becomes a bit more yeah. like the science fiction. Yeah, so where would you encourage yeah. them to start? Yeah. Um, for people who want to start with short stories, um, Blood Child is a very good one. Um, if you're okay feeling a little uncomfortable, it's for squeamish people, maybe start with Amnesty um, or Speech Sounds is another um, very great story she won um, a bunch of awards for. Um, novel wise, I generally always recommend Wild Seed. That's the first one I read. Um, I find that is a, a novel I come back to over and over. Um, it's a, it's a beautiful it works thing. very well by itself, even yeah. though it is part of a series. Um, and then probably the most... It's actually almost better to read. Um, it's almost better to read it by itself in a sense, because like, you know, bad yeah. things happen to people that you start to fall in love in with in, in, in Wild yes. Sea, right? Then you read the rest of the series and, you know, it just keeps yep. recreating itself. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and it's... So she actually, she wrote it later on as well. Um, and then probably her most well-read novel is Kindred. Um, that one is very frequently used um, at the university level in high schools. Um, it's her, maybe her least fantastical. Um, there's a time travel element, but it's never really explored. It works really, really well within the story, but in some ways it's, Okay, it's also a metaphor, but it's it works in many ways as a vehicle to do what Butler was trying to do with it. So that's um, that's also a very good one to start with. Yeah, good. Yeah, and I would say just from my side, if you like the um, science fiction, so her biofic is uh, is in kind of one world. If you want a bit of a kind of a space or alien blend to it, you know, I I, I do like Lilith. Um, I do like the you know Genesis trilogy. It's sometimes called or Lilith's Brood. What's the first book called? Is it Dawn? Uh, Dawn, yes. Dawn, yeah. Um, which was uh, I think first pictured with a white uh, character on the front, though it's a black yes, it was. Pro protagonist. So this is one of the whitewashing moments in Octavia Butler's uh, publication yep. history, uh, which her fans took up I think with enough voice that they yes, kind of worked that through, yeah. um, and actually listened to the the audio once of, of uh, that trilogy and there's a gorgeous reader for that too so th there's ways into the books and you can find some of the short stories online if you're interested well I want to thank uh, thank you Jens I want to congratulate you this is a this is your last act um, well submitting your thesis to the library is I guess the last act or something um, but this is the end of your thesis process uh, Jens was a, a model student in the sense that he did did all the stuff that uh, that happens throughout despite you know, a global pandemic that I think Octavia Butler would have been really interested to write about um, or write in the context yeah. of today. And so maybe if you want to take up her mantle, uh, this might be a good time to kind of do that uh, and learn the lessons from her as a master uh, uh, of, of, of the kinds of fiction that we we're talking about. So I want to thank, you know, Sarah Brown, who Sarah uh, was, uh, you know, read the thesis, um, even though she didn't have to, she's the supervisor of the thesis program did a great job there and worked with me um, and uh, uh, in a number of ways uh, Dr. Yolanda Hood uh, who was a second reader provided uh, not just assessment but also feedback which is really really quite nice uh, having somebody who is a specialist and uh, who can resonate with the material 
Um, and then uh, also uh, just to, I don't know actually who else. So, so that's, yeah, thank you to you folks. Uh, oh, and uh, G Gabriel, who, who sets up these kinds of things for us to be able to do and everybody else. And I encourage you, as I said at the top of the hour, to check out the events at Signum University for what's going on with our fall fundraising plan. This will be up on our Signum University uh, YouTube channel uh, in a few days uh, once our crack team of professionals are able to pull it together. And, and I think we're at the done here. So I do want to, there's some conversation points coming in here. Uh, Chris Swank says, uh, congratulations, Yen, uh, fantastic work. Oh, and how could, um, how could they reach you if they wanted to get a copy of the thesis itself? Because um, it's in our uh, yeah, you, library, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, it'll be in the Signum library. Um, you could send me an email, uh, jheber at dalat.org, at d-a-l-a-t.org. Um, if you send me an email there, I'm happy to attach my paper and send it to you. Good stuff. And there was so much more I wanted to talk about, um, like the fact that you're an alien, right? That you live as an alien, you know, and actually you've done that in a number of places and in different kinds of ways, right? That would have been interesting. Um, and uh, maybe sometime we'll press in a bit more on this kind of stuff and maybe bring some other authors together. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, congratulations here from Gabriel as well. And congratulations from me. Everyone, thanks for your participation uh, and uh, look forward to uh, great thesis theaters uh, in the days ahead. Okay, thank you. Good night, everyone. Awesome. And congratulations. Thank you. Bye-bye now.